And we're joined once again by Quam McKenzie, as he has been here all week long and will be here through the rest of the week. The Professor of Psychiatry from the University of Toronto and Medical Director of Diversity and Mental Health at CAMH. We have uh, already established that you were born in London. You also lived some of your life in Boston and then eventually came here. And I'd like to know what you knew of or thought of Toronto before you actually settled here. Toronto, I thought quite highly of, partly because uh, my wife was at UTS here, at uh, the school here, for three years. University of Toronto University schools. of Toronto Schools. She was at University of Toronto Schools for three years. The kids had visited. They all loved uh, Toronto. And so I was very happy at the idea of coming to Toronto until I started looking at websites. And the websites uh, from immigrants who go to Toronto are very, very negative. How come? They talk about the Canadian experience, not being able, having uh, qualifications that nobody takes any notice of. They talk about it, finding it difficult, therefore, to find work. This is the proverbial engineer who's driving a cab or something yes, like that. Yeah. Uh, the, Toronto is literally the only place where I have, you know, how cab drivers talk about philosophy. <laughs> and London cab drivers talk about philosophy. Uh, Canadian cab drivers are philosophers. And I have actually been in a cab with a philosopher, with a professor of philosophy. Okay. But in spite of what you read on the websites, you did decide to come here. Yes. So what sold you on the place? The diversity. If you look around the world, we're now in a situation where there are over 20 cities that have between half a million and a million uh, foreign-born. Hmm. This is happening all over the world. In London, I've been working on diversity and mental health services. Um, but uh, Canada, and especially Toronto, is where the diversity is. That's hyper-diversity, really. Not just London, where you've got South Asia, and you've got Africa, and you've got Caribbean. The whole world is in Toronto. Well, I know the school board prides itself on having students who speak 130 different languages. Yeah. And if you so want, you see that. You see that. And the way the world works is, in my opinion, is that, that diversity is going to be important when you're thinking about you know, where something is, where, how you're going to get on in the world. Uh, I, was, I was very taken by going down to Andalusia in southern Spain. Mm -hmm and uh, looked, went to Granada, went to Cor uh, Cordoba. And if you go to Cordoba, you actually see these monuments to diversity. So one of the places they have is called the Mesquite. And the Mesquite is a um, old Visigog church with a mosque built on top of it. And if you walk into the middle of the mosque, you come to a cathedral. And when this place, when the whole of Andalusia was run, by the Moors, so it was run by Muslims, mm. had a very tolerant society. They had a Jewish population which was large, they had a Christian population and they ran it. And that was the center of commerce for the world when they had that diversity. Move forward to the Spanish Inquisition in the 1400s. I was going to say, you're, you're talking 600 years ago now, yeah, 700 years exactly. ago. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You move to the Spanish Inquisition, religious intolerance, the economy died. It was the center of the economy for the world when it was diverse. When it stopped being diverse, it just died. And you think that lesson is applicable for today? I think that lesson is more applicable today. <laughs> if you look in Toronto, Toronto is a gateway not only to uh, America, but it's a gate if you, you know, a million people from uh, East Asia, a million people from uh, South Asia, uh, people from all corners of the world with links to all corners of the world, Russia, Ukraine, the, you know, various parts of uh, England, Italy, Portugal. In theory, using those connections and linking them together, plus having an immigrant population that is clever because you can't get in unless you get enough points. <laughs> yeah. and to, you know, I thought you were going to say you can't get in unless you're clever. Well, you can't really yeah. get in unless you're yeah. clever, unless you're coming in with family. Mm -hmm. But the, the primary person who's coming in has to be clever. And if you're a refugee, you have to be a refugee who's smart enough to get from what is usually uh, often a country in Africa or uh, South uh, Asia, mm -hmm. all the way over to Canada. So you, you've got clever people coming here. Well, let me follow up on that with this, because, of course, Toronto likes to pride itself on being the most multicultural city in the world if not the most, one of the most, certainly. And you come from a city, London, UK, which prides itself on integrating multicultural people into the fabric of London society. Who's done it better, Toronto or London? 
Now, London doesn't integrate people. London talks about integrating people, and it's very good at talking a good game, but it really doesn't integrate people very well. So Toronto does it better? Toronto doesn't integrate people very well either. Hmm. So uh, one of the things that they say about Toronto all the time is that Toronto is a mosaic, or Canada's a mosaic. Right, as opposed to the melting pot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But a mosaic is not just a bunch of ceramic tiles thrown on the floor. You do actually have to think <laughs> They are about supposed it. to integrate into a proper design. Yeah, there's supposed yeah. to be some intelligent design here. Maybe there has to be an idea of what the picture is going to be. And then you have to spend your time not only putting people or groups in place, but making sure they stick and they work as a cohesive whole. So what we would, don't do that. What would the test be for you then to prove that that design actually has some coherence? Well, there is no design. There's no plan as to what the design would be. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we... we, we but you look, through this, you, you look at society and you would see, oh, there is an example of something that proves that we're either integrating well or we're not integrating well. What do you look at? What kinds of things? Well, if we were integrating well, then we wouldn't need the May tree trying to get black faces or diverse faces into every board in, in, in Toronto. Because actually, if you're moving from the bottom in Toronto, even in some of the organizations I'm affiliated with, you see quite a lot of diversity. And as you go up and you get into the boardroom, it just becomes whiter and whiter and whiter. That's not diversity. Uh, TV doesn't look that diverse, though it's more diverse, it usually it, it, it often is. Uh, and even, I mean, this is one of the strange things I saw when I, was in, when I first came to Canada. Um, in Toronto, apart from at Caravana, where is that black population? Yeah. Um, What's the answer to that? Well, you don't see it. You don't see it because the, all the evidence seems to show that at the age of five or six, if you are African origin or Caribbean origin and you go into school, partly because of poverty and other things, you, you're just a little bit behind, maybe just a few points behind on standard testing. By the time you reach 16, you are a long way behind. Because the school system writes you off in some respects? The school system is not at the moment delivering for our diverse population. If it's not done, it, it, for the, certainly for the African and Caribbean population, it doesn't deliver for poor people as well as it does for rich people. Uh, and, but some, some populations do do well, the East Asian population, particularly in the South Asian popula population uh, behind it. But uh, they have the family base, uh, you know, underpinning a lot of that success. And I guess the question is, can the school system overcome what you don't get at home? I think that building resilient communities is important. I'm, it's not completely clear that you don't get support at home if you're of African or Caribbean origin. Um, you know, people want the best for their but kids. We, but we see the stats. We know, like in Portuguese communities, in, in visible minority, in African Canadian communities or Caribbean Canadian communities. Uh, I mean, the statistics show us that there is less parental involvement in the lives of students than there is in other communities that are doing better in the system. Completely right, but the question is, why is there less parental involvement? Is it because the parents don't care, or is it because the parents are holding down two jobs? Right, and dealing with poverty and all of that. Dealing with all of the things one has to deal with. Don't know how the you know, the system works. Dealing with health issues, which are against a consequence of poverty. So, people. I'm always worried when it seems that um, people are blaming. Um, sort of poor immigrant communities for the successes of their kids. There's quite a lot of work that shows that if you put a kid in a good school, irrespective of their family background, they do better than if you put them in a, in a poor school. Well, let me read this to you and I just uh, give, give me your, your sort of first reaction to this. This is about second generation Canadians from the Canada Yearbook, 2007 from StatsCan. In general, Second-generation Canadians are more educated and earn more on average than Canadians of a similar age whose parents were both born here. What's your reaction to that? That doesn't surprise me if you look in general. Because if you look in general, what you're looking at is you're looking at, um, you're taking an average, and the average would be looking at people of uh, South Asian and East Asian populations, because they're the biggest populations, mm -hmm. who tend to do reasonably well at school. But that's different from 
um, some of the African populations, some of the Caribbean populations, some of the Hispanic populations, and definitely from the Aboriginal population as well. So if you lump everybody together as an immigrant, uh, yeah, you can get those sort of <laughs> sorts of results. You've got to break it down better. You've right. got to. You've got to be a bit. We've got to be a bit cleverer than that because we've got to. If we're going to produce public policy, we have to know what we're doing. Let me try this then. Here's another paragraph. Same StatsCan source. Second generation Canadian men, born from 1964 to 1976, also have an earnings advantage about six percent higher average weekly earnings in the year 2000, except if their father was born in the Caribbean. Central America, South America, or Oceania. Those second generation Canadian men had earnings 14% below the average. Mm. Again, first reaction. I think that reflects what I just said uh, in some ways. If you, if you start breaking it down and you're looking at uh, some, of the, some populations, some populations do much worse than others. Um, if they're born between the ages of ni between 1964 and 1976, 76, mm -hmm. then uh, actually, when you're looking at 196, uh, up to 1961, 90% of the immigration to uh, Canada was from Europe. Mm -hmm. So those second generation are mainly European. Right. Yeah. And so you're comparing European second generations to non-European second generations. So 90% immigration from Europe in, uh, in 1961 and before. So if Toronto really wants to project and proclaim itself as the future is here, and these figures all suggest that we've still got a bit of a job to do in terms of integration. And you say we don't have a plan. Okay, put a plan forward. What should, what should a proper integration of new Canadians into the fabric of this city, what should that look like? So 15 minutes or how, how many, how, how much, how much longer? How much time have we got, got How much time have we got to? Two to, and a half minutes? Three minutes. Three we've minutes. We've got three minutes yeah. to, to work out the problems of the whole of Canada from someone who's been which here three years two, only. Which is two, two, two minutes and 50 seconds longer than you'll get on any local newscast. So keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start from the beginning. Why are some people failing and some people doing well? You know, let's just ask the question. Let's do the research and let's find out. Mm -hmm. Is it the schools? Is it the school system? Is it, what we've been, uh, is it what we're teaching in school? Is it the fact that we haven't been renovating the way we teach kids in school? I mean, we're teaching kids the same now as we did 100 years ago, roughly. So we've got to look into all that stuff. We've got to look into all of that stuff. We've got to think about where people are and the communities and what we can do about diversifying communities. We've got to think about what we can do about changing the curriculum so that the curriculum is more welcoming for different people. More welcoming, what does that mean? Well, more welcoming. Because everybody question. says that's code word for de-emphasizing literacy, reading, writing, arithmetic, and all that. Rubbish. Okay. Don't, don't think that. Okay. I'm thinking when we've got examples and we're looking through the history, what, what, what history are we teaching? You're, you're saying uh, old white guys. I think so. I think even My Michael Ignatieff was saying when he went over to BC, he was amazed that when he was teaching history there, uh, people in BC were saying, what's this about? This history seems to be about <laughs> Toronto and Quebec. <laughs> so we need to actually have to produce relevance. Um, you know, we don't have to skimp on uh, quality, we just have to produce relevance. We have to think of the fact that we're computing, uh, competing with an age, uh, of an age where kids see things differently. But we also have to think of how we can give people economic incentives. It is a travesty that there are people in uh, Toronto who are clever, who think that uh, being recruited to work and sell drugs is a better option mm -hmm. than going to school, getting a job, and going to university. That's a failure of government policy. Okay. Having said that, would, do you believe, and, and I guess there's really no way to know this other than what your gut instinct tells you, do you believe that most of the young people who go to school in this city feel pretty good about the future? That's a good question. I, I'm interested, it, there, is a, there are some studies uh, that have looked at that, and those studies seem to show that if you look at the 21 or 22, 22 OECD countries, and you look at the optimism of, the young, of youngsters, Canada's about 13th. Right in the middle. Jeez, you'd think we should be higher with everything this country's got going you for it. You would think a country that has oil, that has space, that has clever immigrants coming to it, that has nice people, because Canadians, I, I know people say, you know, it's not very nice. <laughs> so the, the word nice isn't always a right term, but has all these things. 
uh, and is a nice place to live, you would think that the kids would be doing better than uh, 13th. You, you know, obviously, the, one of the real problems with Canada is it's next to America, and America's bottom of the list, mm. with the UK just after it. Mm. Um, but, and so we compare ourselves to the Americans and say we're doing very well. But we're actually 13th on that list. Quem, as always, this has been fascinating, and we shall do it again tomorrow and the day after. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.